Welcome to Kingdom Reality, your gateway to deep insights into the truths and realities of God's kingdom. Dive deep into the teachings of esteemed teachers of God's Word as they illuminate the mysteries of Scripture, offering priceless wisdom and revelations. Our channel serves as a beacon of enlightenment, guiding seekers on a transformative journey towards understanding the essence of divine truth and purpose. Join us as we explore the depths of spiritual reality and embark on a quest for genuine understanding and spiritual growth, revealing kingdom realities. In the heart of time, amidst the whispers of eternity, lies a divine library unlike any other the scriptures. Welcome, dear seekers of truth, to a journey through the profound doctrine of the scriptures, from the dawn of creation. The words of the scriptures were not born of private inspiration but were received by holy men of God through divine revelation. The scriptures are not merely the product of human intellect, but the very breath of God breathed into the hearts of those chosen to pen his eternal message. Through the ages, the scriptures have stood as a beacon of light, illuminating the path to righteousness and salvation. Let us delve into the depths of these sacred texts, where every word, every verse, is a testament to the divine wisdom and love of our Creator. As we embrace the doctrine of the scriptures, may we open our hearts to receive the timeless truths they impart, and may we be transformed by the power of their divine revelation, for in the pages of the scriptures, we find not just words, but the very essence of God's love and guidance for humanity. Embark on this sacred journey. The Library of God awaits. This book was inspired. It was inspired. Isaiah 34 verse 16. Such ye, out of the book of the law, read. None of these things will fail. The mouth of the Lord, it has spoken it. His spirit gathered it. That's why it is consistent. It was gathered. The Holy Ghost gathered. Precepts upon precepts. Lines upon lines, here a little, there a little. Those who don't know how to guide, who are not guided by the Holy Ghost to, to gather the puzzle, they are the ones who are stranded. But those who are illuminated, they know the book is precise. Trust me, no book has been debated upon like the Bible. All the scholars, the historians agree that this book is accurate. Second thing about Doctrine of scripture is the authority of scripture. Why should the scripture have authority? Why should we live our lives according to scripture? What gives the scripture the authority that it so has? The first thing that gives it authority is the fact that it was inspired. It's the word of God, so it must have authority. Isaiah 34 verse 16, it says, Search you out of the book of the Lord, read. He said, None of these things shall fail. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. His spirit has gathered it. And Jesus speaking, he said, man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew 4 verse 4. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus himself made the book an authority because it came from God. It is inspired. So if you live without the word, you are in trouble. Because your creator says the book should have an authority over you. So why does the book have authority? Because it was inspired. Number two. Why does he have authority? Jesus' attestation of the book gives it authority. The one who forwarded the book is Jesus. John 10, 35. He said, and the scriptures cannot be broken. That's Jesus' testimony about the book. The scriptures, ye are God's, because you are the children of the Most High. If he says you are God, unto whom the word of the Lord came and the scriptures cannot be broken Jesus gave an attestation about the scripture that's why we cannot not submit to it Luke 24 44 he said the law and the prophets they spoke about me that is Jesus' testimony about the book this is why the book has authority number three why does the book have so much authority the apostles witnessed to it. Luke chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they committed them to us, who were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world. They were servants of the scriptures. They served it. 
That's their testimony. This is the word of God. We are the servants of the world. We are ministers of the world. So if the apostles submit to it, who are we not to? So the witness of the apostles gave it credence. Second Peter 1.16 We were with him on the mount when he received the excelling, excelling glory. He said, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter was saying, we have seen the best of revelations. We saw Jesus transfigured. We heard the father say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We saw Moses and Elijah stood there. We have seen the highest visions. He said, but what is written is superior to those visions. We have a more sure word of prophecy. So the apostles attest that none of our personal experience is superior to scripture. Look at Jesus' life. Jesus was at the Jordan. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The, the, the spirit took him to the wilderness to be tempted. And the devil came and said, if you are the son of God, turn this stone to bread. If you were the one, what will you say? Didn't you hear God announce me 40 days ago? Go and ask people. I had an encounter. Jesus said, I'm the son of God. He said it in a stadium. Everybody heard. Jesus didn't use encounters. It is written. It is written. It is written. Why? The scriptures cannot be broken. That's why if you like, go to the third heavens. There's nothing you bring that is superior to it is written. The guide, the guide, the scripture has more authority than your encounter. And in fact, it's the scripture that validates your encounters. We trivialize the Bible in our generation. People come and they tell you all their encounters with Elijah, with Moses, with Enoch, with God, with Satan. I love encounters. I've had some myself. But don't preach your encounters. Preach the word of God. Your encounters can inspire men. Only the word can build men. That's why you find people who go to all these places where they only talk encounter. They are excited, but they don't have stability. Because there's no word in their spirit. They have no regard for the word of God. Why does the scripture have authority? Historical accuracy. There has never been one historical record that suggests that what the Bible said was a lie. Those of you who study biblical archaeology, you are going to see that most of the things the Bible spoke about, archaeologists have discovered. The other day they saw in the belly of the Red Sea, bones of thousands of bones that have been in the belly of that sea for aeons. And they knew those were the bones of the Egyptians that were drowned. Even the Ark of Noah, they found where it stopped. So every day, archaeologists are finding things consistent with what the Bible said. So there are historical evidences. And you can go on YouTube today or Google and type. Historically verified evidences of Bible accuracy or Bible truth. They will bring many to you. Every day they keep discovering to show you that the things the scriptures claim are actually true. So it gives the Bible authority because it is consistent and accurate. And then finally, what gives the Bible its authority? Again, I add, its power of transformation. Anybody who submits to the Bible is transformed. So the Bible can have authority. There is jurisdiction for the Bible to be given that level of authority. Now let's look at inerrancy of scripture or inability of scriptures to err, which is the third major thing about the doctrine of scripture why do we believe that the scriptures cannot err or there's no error in scripture i give you five quickly number one if it was inspired by god it can't err because god cannot err and we have seen already that it was inspired second peter 1 20 21 second timothy 3 16 the Bible should err if God errs. But we have seen that God cannot err. And so if it comes from God, it shouldn't err. So if the book was inspired, then it can't err. Number two, why do we believe the Bible is inerrant? Because of the testimony of the Bible. Proverbs 30 verse 5. Proverbs 30 verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Every word of God, another scripture says, is accurate. So the scriptures 
testify of itself to be inerrant. Psalm 119 verse 160. <laughs> Thy word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgment endured forever. It says thy word is true. So scriptures attest that scripture is without error. Number three. Why do we affirm the inerrancy of scripture? Consistency in fulfillment of prophecy. And I've said that already. Every prophecy that scriptures postulated has consistently been proven. Number four. Why do we believe that the scripture is inerrant? Jesus himself said that the scriptures don't err. John 17, 17. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is true. Truth. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is what? Truth. John 10, 35. The scriptures cannot be broken. So Jesus himself affirms that the scriptures is inerrant. Why do we believe in inerrancy of scripture? Historical facts that corroborate the assertions of scripture. Everything scriptures affirms, most things rather, scriptures affirms have been confirmed historically. And then lastly, why do we believe in the inerrancy of scripture? Consistency in the message. And I need to say something here about consistency. Now when you read the Bible, you are going to find certain little, little, little incoherencies here and there. And let me outline some for you because somebody listening to me now talking about inerrancy will start quoting something. There are five major classes of discrepancies you find in scripture but they are not errors. Let me list them for you so that you know and then you know how to explain them. Number one, is differences in numbers and certain details. For example, there are certain passages. If you read First Kings four twenty six and Second Chronicles nine twenty five, where the Bible spoke about Solomon's tables, where he keeps his sheep and donkeys, you are going to find certain little, little, little inconsistencies in numerical values but you see these things are not necessarily errors these things are actually a product of the emphasis of the one who is writing because when god if two of us are here please come up two of you come up let me show you something because every message has emphasis Imagine both of them are here and they are people that God used to write scripture. My God. Lord, help me. Let me be part of them too. Imagine they showed up here now and God wants them to write a message about what they are seeing. To him, God's emphasis might be about the degree of the transformation of these people. God's emphasis may not be about the number of the people. So when he's writing, he can say several people or 50, over 50 people heard the word of God in three months and they were all transformed and they became mighty. Are you seeing that? God may talk to him to write about these same people. But the emphasis may not be on transformation. The emphasis may be on how many people were attracted in three months. So he wrote about the degree to which people were transformed in three months. He is writing about how many people were attracted in three months. When this one is writing, he can say 54 people were attracted to God in three months. Now, hope, both, you know, both of them speaks about the power of God. But the emphasis of this power dimension is transformation. So little emphasis is given to number. 
The emphasis of this power dimension is an akazo, the ability to draw men to God. So he gives little emphasis to transformation. When you are reading from his perspective, you may want to floor this guy. They both got a message from God and the messages are correct, but their emphasis are different. So why this one may not give so many much priority to number, this one will give much priority to number. That is why you may, it may look as if there is little inconsistency. But the truth is, the message that they pass will not change. It will be correct. For example, when you read about the, read from the synoptic gospel on salvation, on the miracles of Jesus, you will find Luke talk about when Jesus was entering Jericho. He said, Bartimaeus was screaming. And then you hear Matthew talk about or Mark, now I can't remember exactly. When Jesus was coming out of Jericho, he heard Bartimaeus shouting. And then you look at it, you say, of course, the Bible is not correct. How can this one say, when Jesus was entering? This one say, when Jesus was coming out? That's not the emphasis. The message is about Jesus showing compassion to the sick and healing them. So their focus was not when they heard the shout. Because if you match the story together, the truth is that, Bartimaeus started shouting from when Jesus entered, but Jesus attended to him when Jesus was going. So he shouted from when Jesus entered until Jesus was leaving. But the emphasis of the writer is not when he started shouting. The emphasis of the writer was when Jesus healed him. So they will focus on the action. It takes a man who understands the character of God to know that this guy was screaming from when Jesus came until when Jesus left. So when we speak about inerrancy, our focus are not little, little details that is not the message. Our focus is actually the substance of the message. You will never hear this man say that Jesus didn't heal Bartimaeus. Why this one claimed that Jesus healed Bartimaeus? There will be consistency in the message, sorry, that Jesus actually met somebody blind and healed him. So the goal is the message of healing and compassion and it will be consistent. If you re read about the story of the resurrection, you find these little, little inconsistencies as well. Either with Mary Magdalene or when they showed up and all of that. But that's not the message. The message is, did Jesus die? Yes. Was he buried for three days? Yes. Did he raise, rise from the dead? Yes. You will never see any of the writer claim that Jesus did not resurrect. All of them were consistent that Jesus died. All of them were consistent that Jesus was buried. And all of them were consistent that Jesus rose from the dead. So the focus of God was the message. And each of them downloaded everything about the message. That is why John 21, the Bible said, many things did Jesus that were not written. He said, but these ones are written that you may believe. So God is focused on the message, not the little, little things that were not captured in the message. And you also need to know that these people were writing to different people. So God had to get them to focus on specific things. For example, the writer of Matthew was writing to the Jews. And his focus was to show Jesus as the Messiah, the King. The writer of the book of Mark was not writing particularly to the Jews. His focus was to show Jesus as the servant and the steward of God. The writer of the book of John was writing to focus on Jesus as the son of the living God. So you will find same story, but emphasis different. Why this one is trying to convince the Jewish man that this is the king you have been waiting for. This one is trying to show anybody who believes that this Jesus is servant. And so for you to be accurate with God, you must be a servant. Why John wants to show you that Jesus is the life of God so that you can walk in the supernatural. So the story and the message will be consistent but you need to find out what is the emphasis. So the reason people speak of discrepancies is not necessarily because there is discrepancy. It's either because emphasis is different, historical pers perspective is different, or literary style is different. Because when somebody is writing and he's using a different literary style, maybe he is writing and he focuses on personification. Everything he wants to emphasize, he will try to animate it and relate it with human you know humans and living things this one may be using hyperbole and so everything he's saying is allegorical you now show up and you are reading you can't tell that oh 
apart from perspective, there are also different literary styles. So this guy can see 1,000 and say a huge multitude. This one can see 1,000 and say, use something. The number of a chariot. Maybe they use number of chariot as 1,000 in that generation. And then you show up, you are trying to contradict it. This is why you also need to understand the law of biblical interpretation. So the Bible does not have error. And the reason we say the Bible does not have error is not because there are no little, little discrepancies. It's actually because the message does not change. There is consistency in the message. If you read the Bible, you will know that the message from Genesis to Revelation is constant. And there's no controversy. There's no discrepancy. God bless you. So anytime, anytime somebody draws your attention to Bible and says, look at this number, look at this, ask him, what is the message? Do you understand the message? If he understands the message, ask him, is there any discrepancy between the two testimonies? If there's no discrepancy, tell him the Bible does not err. Have you been in an accident scene before? Both of you eyewitnesses. Go to where three eyewitnesses narrate story. You will now be shocked what they were all focusing on. So God guides the mind of people to focus on particular emphasis in order to communicate the same message. So that when you see from different perspective, you can have the holistic picture. The message is constant. Glory to God. Are you following? And there's also the discrepancy of um, we don't have the original documents. The documents we have are copies of copies of copies. Because the truth is, the original manuscripts were lost. It is the copies of copies of copies. So maybe you carry the book of Luke. Maybe the copies that were replicated were five copies gotten from people who had 50th copy, 80th copy, 90th copy. That's how they gathered the scripture. So I can have the book of Mark, for example. You can have the book of Mark. He can have the book of Mark. My own may be 35th copy. That's where I got my own copy from. His own may be from 58th copy. His own may be from 100th copy. So there are people who argue that what we have are photocopies. We don't have original. If we had original, we would have had a big problem. You know why? The argument would have been that how do we know it's the original? So thank God we have copies. <laughs> What's the beauty of having copies? If I have copy number 400, you have copy number 250, and you have copy number 30, and each copy are saying the same thing, there is a likelihood that it is correct. Because if it was not correct, the different copies would have passed different messages. So the fact that we have different copies from different eras, from different people, and it is consistent, is a proof that that was a real message. See this message you are listening to now. Imagine that after maybe three years, you take yours home, somebody copies it and go. You take yours own, somebody copies, another person copies. You take your own, somebody copies, another copies, another copies. And then after 10 years, they say, where is that message Apostle Mike preached on the doctrine of scripture? You say, Kai, we don't have the original copies anymore. But this person has the second copy. This one has the fourth copy. This one has the ninth copy. They now say, bring all the copies. They now bring all the copies. And they see that the message is consistent. Then you now know that that's the real message. Because if it was not the message, our copies will vary. But if the copies are consistent, even after many copies, then it's a proof that that is the real message. Are you following? So all of these things can be argued. But let me give you five of them. When we have time, we can study them. But tonight, no time. So the first area of seeming discrepancy is the area of difference in numbers and details. The second area is the area of chronological discrepancy chronological discrepancy matters that have to do with dates and successions the third area is in the area of genealogy of jesus christ if you study matthew 1 luke 3 you are going to see a little bit of differences in genealogy one speaks of joseph another speaks of mary it's still about emphasis so when you talk when you trace the genealogy to mary you are trying to emphasize the fact that it was a virgin that gave birth when you trace the genealogy to joseph you are trying to emphasize that he is of the lineage of david and abraham 
So, it's still the same story. At the end of the day, when you read the whole document, you are going to discover that he was his parents were Mary and Joseph. By prophecy, he was the seed of David. And by biological birth, he was the seed of a virgin. So, the whole message will now give you the whole picture. But it doesn't mean that it was an error. It's just about emphasis. Because all of these things matter to God. The fifth, the fourth area of seeming discrepancy is the area of the different accounts of the gospel. But I've told you already, the message is consistent. And then the last area is the area of the question of the sovereignty of God. There are scriptures that prove that God is in control of everything. There are other scriptures that prove that we must take responsibility. So how do we rationalize? It's about doctrinal explanation. If you understand doctrine, you can rationalize the two. Yes, although God is sovereign, but he has given the earth to the sons of men so that we can exercise our free will. So the sovereignty of God makes available, the will of man makes accessible. I can make money available in your account. If you don't go to the bank, you won't have it. So by sovereignty, God makes everything available. By sovereignty, God watches over everything. But by reason of his sovereignty, he allows man to exercise free will. So it is what a man wants that he will have. Are you following? So all of these things have their balances. But the problem with many people is that they don't approach the scripture with sincerity. They don't approach the scripture with humility. And approach the scripture allowing the Holy Ghost to teach them. They come to contradict the scripture. So at the end of the day, they get confused. But when God shows mercy, sometimes he encounters them. So that they enter the substance of the message. We are out of time. I will stop here. <laughs> go and read. Go and read the rest. How many of you will read? So let me give you what we read. How many of you want note? Let me give my note so that you go and study. So there are four more things. The fourth thing is clarity. And clarity is simple. Can the Bible be understood? Of course it can. It can be understood. The Bible said you should be careful so that you don't allow yourself to be beguiled like the serpent beguiled Eve from the simplicity of the gospel. The Bible can be understood. You only need to approach it with purity, with humility, submitted to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing is sufficiency. Is the Bible sufficient? Yes, it's sufficient. Proverbs 10, verse 5 and 6. Write the scriptures down quickly and go and do your study. Proverbs 10, Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Then Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. Revelations 22, verse 18 to 19. See what the Bible said. It said, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Verse 6. It said, add thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee and thou shalt be found a liar. The Bible is complete. It's sufficient. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I have commanded you, neither shall it diminish aught from it, that ye, may be kept, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I have commanded. Revelations 22 verse 18 to 19. The scripture is sufficient. It's complete. For I testify unto every revelations. Yeah. Unto every man that heareth the word of prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him plagues that are written in these books. If you add, plagues will be added. The Bible is enough. Please don't add more. Even the ones we have now, we have not uh, consumed all. What we have is sufficient. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the word of this prophecy, of this book. If any man add, he said, plagues shall be added unto him. And you know, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 said, According as his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we have all. And when we say all, we say all in the sense that what we have in the scripture is enough to make us know God. What we have in the scripture is enough to make us believe in God and in Jesus Christ. What we have in scripture is enough for us to receive salvation. What we have in scripture is enough to bring us into Christian maturity. And what we have in scripture is enough to guide us into eternity. Purposeful and fruitful eternity. So, scripture is sufficient. Hallelujah. Then you have canonicity. 
go and study about this as well. There are five things that the elders considered in order to gather the books that they have gathered. Because canonicity is simply the art or the process of guiding, of putting scriptures together to make them an authority for the believer. And there are five things. Number one is every book they picked must be divinely inspired. So divine inspiration was the first consideration. Second Timothy 3.16, it says every scripture is given by what? The inspiration of God. So any book that is not inspired, the elders did not canonize. Number two is apostolic authority. Any book that the apostles did not validate was not canonized. And the reason is because they wanted to be sure that the books were consistent with the teachings of, of, of Christ. So only the books validated by the apostles were canonized. Second Peter 3 verse 2 and 16. You saw Peter talking about the writing of Paul to also be scripture. He said that, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. And then verse 16 he showed us how that the writings of Paul were also scripture. The third thing that the apostles considered is the orthodox orthodoxy of scripture. Whether the teachings of that book is consistent with the general message of the Bible. So any book of the scripture that comes with a message that is different from the general message of the Bible, they didn't take it. Because scripture is supposed to bear witness to scripture. Scripture is supposed to validate scripture. So the elders made sure that only the book, hope you know there are some apocryphas that were not canonized in the early church. You see the book of Tobit. You see the book of Enoch. He's just talking about angels in the seventh, in the seventh heaven. Meanwhile, it's not, it's not, it doesn't align with salvation. It doesn't align with the knowledge of God. It doesn't mature you. It's just talking to you about esoteric things. Talking about angels that rebel. And it even shows you how that some men went to heaven to judge. Come on. So these things, the, the elders saw that the message was not in alignment with the body of truth from other scriptures. So they avoided it. So that you don't come to church and you start talking about Shimiagza. The angel that led other angels to rebellion. And they tell you where he was locked. Oh God. <laughs> Let's just learn salvation and go to heaven. Glory to God. So, orthodoxy was the third factor. Galatians 1, 8, 9. You see the emphasis? Paul said, if any man bring another gospel that is different from what has been preached, he said, let him be accursed. He said, again, I say unto you, if any man brings another message different from that which we have preached, let him be accursed. Number four is messages that has influenced the church. So they looked at messages that churches received and transformed them. So if those messages that transformed the church or accepted by the church was inspired, approved by the apostolic authority and consistent with orthodoxy, they also included them as canons of scripture. And then number five, historical consensus. When you bring a message, they check the writings of the prophets because Jesus had validated the Old Testament. Is this message consistent with what the prophet said? If it is not, then they cannot canonize it. So there has to be consistency and coherence in revelation. So these were some of the factors that were considered for scriptures to be canonized. When I have time, again, I will deal with laws of biblical interpretation. I know that's where some of you were waiting for. Masters of hermeneutics. God will give us another time. Lift your hands toward heaven. And ask the Lord to breathe on his word in your heart. Ha ha he. He he ha. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Ha ha he ha he ha. Of the things you heard, you didn't hear them well. Go and listen again and then study those books, study those scriptures, study those references. See where the world is going to. 
your faith will be challenged. Though. I'm telling you. You may have good sensations in church. It's good. Though. Enjoying God's presence. Enjoying God's power. But where the world is going to, your faith will be challenged. These things we are saying that looks like joke. Hope you know that AI is rewriting Bible now and reinterpreting them. And in the nearest future, they will add things that if you don't know the, 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 the severity in staying with what God said, you may take for granted and you may be doomed. And see where our world is going. Many things will be suggested to us and then forced down our truth. They have migrated from technology to internet to robotics, you know, genetic engineering to AI. And you know, the highest level of AI is from cosmic AI to God AI. There are seven evolutions of AI. We are just on, we are entering the third evolution. The third evolution is general artificial intelligence. We are beginning to migrate from artificial intelligence to general artificial intelligence because the artificial intelligence we have now is stereotype it focuses on one issue and deals with it but general artificial intelligence will begin to handle general things but there are seven evolutions of ai the last evolution is god evolution ai will develop to a level where you have cosmic ai where ai will begin to study planetary bodies study their movements study their compositions study their interactions and they'll begin to hope to create planets to connect planets and their goal is to see that if there's a possibility of realms that cannot be accessed like Hades through AI networking if there's a planet or a place like hell it can predict it and using quantum computers they can trace it regardless the distance or the time loop so that by all means they'll look for a way to bridge regions you don't know where we are going no. this is why you must know what you know and know it well have perfect understanding so that a time comes when it will be better to die in faith than to compromise you know the elders died in faith they didn't change their confession lift your hands toward heaven one prayer lord help me to stay true with the scriptures for your word this words take root in our hearts and by the strength of your spirit we apply them and we produce results in the mighty name of Jesus Christ Amen. sit down for a moment we are shutting down I apologize for for taking your time it's Bible study sometimes it's good to stretch you have you been touched by the message you just heard and you want to give your life to Jesus or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior then say this short prayer Lord I admit I am a sinner I need and want your forgiveness I accept your death as the penalty for my sin and recognize that your mercy and grace is a gift you offer to me because of your great love not based on anything I have done Cleanse me and make me your child. Be faithy receive you into my heart as the Son of God and as Savior and Lord of my life. From now on, help me live for you, with you in control. In your precious name, Amen. Congratulations to you. If you have just said that prayer, you are now a child of God. Look around you for a Bible-believing church and also ask Jesus to direct you to the church where you can continue to serve Him. Consider subscribing to this channel too, so that you'll keep learning the realities of God's kingdom. God bless you.